promise he has given us tonight for the two or three are gathered together in my name he says I'll be in the midst and he's here today to change your life and to save your soul. Thanks for us. So uh, let's get busy and let's get others in under the sound of the gospel. We thank the Lord for what has happened this past week, for souls being saved. And we give the Lord all the glory for that. And let's pray that this week coming in that many more new names will be written in the Lamb's Book of Life. We're going to stand down and sing our opening hymn, 186, a golden only, 
on a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. 186. Standing the same, thank you for the cross for playing. Thank Andrew down there. And we want to welcome to our soloists, uh, Lynn McNeese, all the way from Dungannon and Burnham. Okay, 186. Thank you. seek the Lord together in prayer and ask for the Lord's help uh, just uh, in our service. Our gracious, loving Father, we do thank you again for this opportunity of bowing in thy presence. We thank you for your faithfulness and love and mercy. We thank you, Lord, for every blessing that we receive from thy hand. 
we thank you for this day. Lord, we, we praise you, dear Father, for the opportunity of singing the great songs of Zion. We thank you, loving Father, for revealing yourself to us. Lord, we stand amazed in the presence of the one who loved us and gave himself for us. Lord, we just lift our hearts in grateful thanks to thee. Pray, dear Father, that you will bless in this time that we spend together. We know, Lord, that it may be a busy day for many. But, oh, Father, we pray that you will draw near to us. And, oh, Father, we pray that we might sense the presence of God in our service. We thank you, dear Father, for the one who loved us and gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity. Lord, we bless thee, dear Father, that we have a hope that is built on nothing less than the sacrifice of Calvary. Lord, we thank you for those who know the joy of salvation. But Lord, we pray, Father, for this community and for our city and for those who are proclaiming the gospel. We ask, loving Father, that, hey, Lord, you will uh, give help from heaven. But Lord, that there might be others also who will come to experience the joy of salvation. We pray that you'll bless my missions across the province for services across my lord and the land we thank you for everywhere where the gospel is proclaimed we pray that you'll bless roger and the mission there and crew we ask lord that you'll encourage and lord that there might be souls that will come to know you we pray for other places lord where there are 10 missions just like this proclaiming the same message that christ jesus came into a sick and the world to save sinners so loving father we pray for your blessing and we thank you dear father for your grace we ask for john we pray to your father that your hand will be upon him as he ministers to us and father we read in your word of how jesus said the spirit of the lord is upon me and, and he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor we ask lord that that same anointing will rest upon john that as he speaks to your father that your uh, voice will be heard and lord that precious souls will know the joy of being set free in jesus so loving father we lift our hearts to thee we pray that you'll bless the one who comes to minister to us in song and for every part of this service we just commit it all to you in jesus precious name amen and we're delighted that Lynn, yes, you're there. Uh, Lynn uh, is going to come and minister to us in song this time. Thank you. Thank you very much for the kind invitation to come along tonight and join with you here. I don't know about you, but I absolutely love a tent mission. There's just something special about being under the canvas, isn't there? And you know, I think there's just also a lovely presence of the Lord that can come in a tent mission. This first piece that I've chosen to sing, um, it's an old hymn and it's actually, I sang one verse of it following a piece that I sang last week at our own mission. And the piece that I sang was called The Family Bible. And it said in it, um, what, what a better world we would have if we had more family Bibles on the table and mothers singing Rock of Ages, Kev for me. And I sang one verse of it and it was still in my heart since I wish I'd sung the rest of it. So I'm afraid you're my audience tonight for the rest of Rock of Ages. <laughs> i 
Moses. Um, I have no technical, technical ability at all to stand up here and sing. What entitles me to stand up here is that I'm just a sinner saved by grace. And you know, it says in this piece, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. And he did that for me, and he can do it for each one of you. Just listen and let the words of this one minister to you. Thank you for 
uh, your prayers for those who know and love the Lord. We value uh, your prayers very much in these days of mission. As I say, the nights pass by very, very quickly, and we're entering now into the second week of our two-week uh, mission. Meetings will continue Monday through to Friday at 8 p.m. every night, and then the final meeting will be next Sunday at 8.15. And there will be someone uh, along to minister in song and also maybe sharing uh, personal testimony uh, over the nights uh, that lie before us. James and Katie Maxwell uh, will be here tomorrow night and they will be singing and sharing uh, in uh, our service. Uh, we're delighted to have John, uh, John Weir, uh, for, as our evangelist for these meetings. I uh, look forward for a, quite a wee while and we're delighted that John will be here every night. So we do encourage you. Uh, there are some invitations. If you can uh, take uh, an invitation, maybe encourage others to come along, uh, then please do that. Uh, but do please pray for us uh, that God will bless his word night by night. We're going to sing together uh, another hymn, and a testimony, what a wonderful change has been wrought in my life. Number 405, 405. What a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. Some, uh, perhaps like myself, brought up in a Christian home with my father as an evangelist. Uh, we're singing some of these hymns for, well, too many years, and I'll tell you how many. Uh, but, you know, we never get tired of, of understanding something of the words that are penned here. And there's some tremendous truths in this hymn. I cease from my wandering and going astray. And the third verse, I'm possessed of a hope that is steadfast and sure. And do you think that's what this mission is all about? There are many people who, who are afraid of the future, who have no security in life, and their hearts are filled with fear. But it's a wonderful thing that there's one who can give to us a real peace in our hearts and give to us an assurance uh, that uh, whenever this life is over, we have a home, a place reserved in heaven for us. That's a tremendous truth. And I thought, trust as we sing this hymn, I was going to call out a verse, but I think there's a great truth in all of these verses, and we're going to sing them all tonight. Number 405, and we stand as we sing together. <laughs> Jesus, give it to my heart. Jesus, give it to my heart. 
Tuesday and Thursday morning at 10 o'clock for a time of prayer and also beforehand at 7 uh, for a short time uh, there will be those meetings together and if you're here early uh, you can join us for prayer. We do thank you for coming and thank uh, him for coming also and Bill Gannon is going to come and minister to us again please. And then I'll hand over to John. just to focus us in on what it's all about, the cross. Watts was certainly inspired when he penned that beautiful hymn, When I Survey the Wonders Cross. Let's turn to Luke's Gospel now in chapter 12. Luke's Gospel, chapter 12, we're going to read at verse 16. 
and let's have no distractions as possible as we turn to God's precious word. I want to speak tonight about a rich farmer who thought that he had plenty of time. Luke chapter 12, I'm reading the verse number 16. And I can encourage you with these nights, bring your Bible with you, bring a little notepad, pen, take some notes over the message when you go home. Luke 12, I'm reading the verse 16. We're told, and he spake a parable unto them, that's the Lord Jesus saying, the ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself saying, what shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, this will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, so thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thy food, this thing, thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself, and is not rich toward God. We'll stop there at verse 21. Keep your Bibles open. Follow me in the gospel message, and may the Lord as always add a blessing to the reading and to the preaching of his precious word. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you already for your presence tonight. And we pray now as we come around your word for these next minutes, that Lord, you will just settle our hearts again after the busyness of another day. Lord, I pray tonight in this tent that you'll save souls again. Lord, I pray that you'll restore the backsliders here. And I pray, Lord, for even your own dear people. The Lord, we may be revived and built up in these days. Lord, I need your help again tonight. This is a new meeting. We need a fresh touch. And we pray that you'll come and give us power and give us liberty. Thank you for men and thank you for our ministry. We pray for our sister that you'll continue to bless. Uh, bless her, Lord, as she serves you and she travels from place to place. Lord, thank you for this time of mission and this time of visitation in this part of Lisburn. <coughs> and pray, Lord, that even tonight you'll build your church. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Folks, I wonder tonight, by way of introduction, has anybody heard of Sir James Bryson? Probably not, but Sir James Bryson is currently the richest farmer in the United Kingdom. He is reported to be worth £16.2 billion. Pounds. He owns 35,000 acres of land throughout Lancashire, Oxfordshire and Gloucestershire. And he also owns Dyson Electrical Products. Here we have a man that has great wealth, great riches, and great possessions. And then it got me thinking, I wonder who the richest farmer is in Lisburn. I wonder if there's any rich farmers in the tent tonight. But I was thinking about this man. I wonder if he's saved. I don't know anything about him. But the Lord Jesus reminds us. In Mark 8 and 36, he says, For what shall it profit a man if he should gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? We are living in a day and generation when many people are judged by the possessions that they have. Is that right? We all love to put people in a box based on the size of their house, the type of car somebody drives, the area that you live in, the type of job that you have. We all are guilty at times of judging people based on what they have of this world's goods. But listen to the Lord Jesus. Look at verse 15 of the chapter. He says something different. Do you see it in your Bibles? He says, Take heed and beware of covetousness. For a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesses. Some of the best Christian people that I know, they have little of this world's goods. But they know the Lord is their Savior. And that's all that matters. The Bible clearly teaches a wealthy person is someone who is Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And I trust that's every man, every woman, every young person, every boy and every girl in the tent tonight that you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. That is the most important thing. And to know that your sins have been forgiven and to know that you're ready for heaven and ready for home. Can I say tonight there's nothing wrong with having money, but we must keep the balance. You must keep the balance. In the Bible, we read about rich men. Abraham was rich. Job was rich. Solomon, Nicodemus, 
Joseph of Arimathea, they were all rich, but we must keep the balance. And I speak to my own heart as I speak to you. And sadly, you all know the story of the, of the rich young ruler, don't you? His love of money, his love of possessions. That's what held him back from following the Lord. And we are told in Mark chapter 10 that he went away sorrowful. I trust that nobody leaves this tent tonight sorrowful, not saved, not forgiven, not going to heaven. I want to leave three quick thoughts tonight in the gospel message from this story. Here's my first point if you're taking notes. I want to consider, first of all, the successful farmer. That's my first point. And I want to paint the picture tonight of this man. Now look at verse number 16. We are told here, and he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. So we can see this rich farmer bringing in a great harvest. And farming isn't an easy, easy job, sure it's not. And we must remember tonight to, to give God thanks for our farmers. I'm sure there's farmers here tonight. Farmers work long hours. I've done missions in different farming areas and speak to all the farmers. And they work long hours. The farmers get up early in the morning. At times they get cold and they get wet. They're often not appreciated and they can get tired. And I think I said the other night, you see the farmers coming into some of the meetings and you start to see them drifting off when they get into the heat. But they work hard. Sadly, people from the city where I live, they don't really appreciate farmers. I read an article recently on the five top qualities that a farmer needs. Here was number one in that article that I read. A farmer needs to have patience. That was number one in the article. And then a farmer needs to know the weather. And then number three was hard work. Farmers work hard. Number four was they have to respect their animals. And number five, they've got to be good with numbers. And, and, and this farmer that we're looking at today, he must have had all these qualities. And God has entrusted farmers to look after his creation. I often think about farmers, do they ever admire God's creation when they're out in the countryside? Do they ever think about the animals? Do you ever think about wildlife and where it all came from? Robert Murray McShane once penned that man made the town, but God made the countryside. And when you go out in the countryside as a Christian, don't you, don't you just marvel at God's creation? Sadly, we're living in days many don't believe in God. Many believe it all just happened by chance. But today, let's remember to give God thanks for our farmers, for the food that we have, for the homes that we have, the comforts we have, the warm beds that we have. God has been good to many of us, hasn't he? And perhaps I'm speaking to the individuals in the tent tonight, and as you look back at your life, God has been good to you. He's blessed you with a good job, a nice wee family, and a good home. You've had a good education. You've had the best upbringing. Maybe even you've been born into a good Christian home. Do you ever give God thanks for that? You ever thank the Lord for his blessings on your life? That what the hymn writer said, count your blessings and name them one by one. And it will surprise you what the Lord has done. I remember going to Ethiopia in 2008 to do some mystery work. It was amazing to see all that they had in Ethiopia and what we have here. I was humbled. I was humbled. In relation to this man, we don't know if he had a family. We don't know if he was married or where he lived, if, if he had any religious background, but he was successful. This man would have been a hard worker. And when you read throughout the chapter, there's no record that he was deceitful, is there? Or he was dishonest, or he was dodging his taxes, or even that he was deep in sin. I believe this man must have been well respected in the local community. And there's many farmers, and they are well respected in the local community. But sadly, this man had, didn't have God's salvation. Is that you to me? There may be well respected in this community. Well respected even in your church, in your place of employment, among your neighbours. But friend, have you got God's salvation today? This is the most important thing. Remember a few years ago, getting a call to see a man and he had an MBE above his bed. He was dying of cancer in the hospice. And he had a plaque, an MBE, and he was telling me all about his MBE and his charity work. I said, sir, what about salvation? You're dying, you're going out into eternity. Are you saved? Do you know that you're saved? Are you ready to meet the Lord? He says, I'm thinking about it. I'm thinking about it. I never heard of that man got saved or not. Well respected in the community for charity work, but he still at that time didn't have God's salvation. 
And you can see this man having great success, having a great harvest. But here was his problem. He was taking all the glory for himself. Now, now how do I know that? Look at verses 17 and 18 of our chapter. Do you notice the personal pronouns? It's all about him. He never gives God any thanks. Do you see it? Verse 17. And he thought within himself, saying, Notice, what shall I do? You see the eyes? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. Look at verse 18. And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. Folks, this man must have been the talk of the countryside, wasn't it? At the harvest that he had brought in, and I could see the neighbours talking about him. Do you know the way in the countryside all the neighbours like to talk? about each other that's one thing i noticed up around the countryside doing gospel missions all the neighbors they know everything about everybody each other and i'm sure that they were talking about about this man the type of tractors i was thinking maybe he was using the sheep the cattle the workers how, how big is his barns going to be it's the talk of the countryside this man listen this farmer had made it in the world's eyes money and possessions was his God. What's your God today? What do you really live for? Maybe for you it's making money. Maybe for you it's your career. Maybe for you it's your, it's your next holiday. Maybe it's your football team. An amazing amount of Christians that they worship their football team more than the Lord. Football was my God for, for 19 years of my life. That's all I thought about. Being a professional footballer, making lots of money, and never once thought about my soul. Ever see Old Trafford? How they worship these footballers? I think somewhere at Old Trafford, it's the Blessed Trinity, best lawn short. Remember going there as a young lad? Couldn't believe it. Social sad. There's many Christians that are not going to their places of worship on a Sunday. They'd rather be watching the football. I grew up with it. I know all about it. It was my God. I think I told you one other night at the men's breakfast about Alec Ferguson petrified of death. And I sent him a booklet, my little booklet with a letter about my testimony and my upbringing. Alec Ferguson done it all in the world's eyes. But a man that's petrified of death. Jesus reminds us, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So many people are driven by money. Is that right? Do you want anybody driven by money? Do you know anybody and money dominates their lives? That's all they think about, making money and there's no time even for the Lord's work. I meet them. How many families fall out over money? How many families fall out over inheritance, fall out over land? They never speak over disagreements. Friends, the Bible reminds us the love of money is the root of all evil. It's not the truth. We all need money to pay our bills and to raise our families. The Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. Listen, which while some would have coveted after, they heard from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. And here's some interesting statistics for the Bible students here tonight. Listen to this. One commentator reckons that in our Bibles, there's about 500 verses about prayer. This is interesting. There's about 500 verses in our Bible about faith, but over 2,000 verses in our Bible about money about money. And John MacArthur, the well-respected Bible teacher, listen to what he said. 16 of the 38 parables the Lord Jesus taught deals with money. One out of every 10 verses in the New Testament deals with that subject. 16 of the 38 parables the Savior taught was all about money. And listen to the old Bishop J.C. Ryan, what he said about money. Two-thirds of, of all the strifes and quarrels and lawsuits in the world arise from one single cause, money. And I love what William Tiptaff said. William Tiptaff was an old Baptist preacher. And this is what he said about money. If rich people only knew when they died how their relations would scramble for their money, they would not be so anxious to save money. <laughs> you ever seen that before? Somebody dies and everybody wants to know what they've been left. <laughs> That's what he said. But you remember the poor widow in Mark's Gospel, chapter 12? She sat at the treasury. She put in those mates, and the Lord knew what she gave. The Lord knows what you give. 
and the Lord knows what I give him. The Savior, what did he say about this wee lady? Mark 12, 43. Listen, verily I say unto you that this poor widow hath cast more in than all they which cast into the treasury. What a difference between the poor widow and the rich farmer. And you know who he was thinking about this afternoon? Old C.T. Stunt that gave away his millions to go to the Belgian Congo to reach people that had never heard the gospel once. And what was the motto of his life? Listen, if Jesus Christ be God and died for me, there's no sacrifice too great for me to make for him. There was a man that didn't care about money. There was a man that had a passion and a burden for souls. And we heard about that this morning at the church, didn't we? The pastor spoke about the burden and the passion for souls. C.T. Stubb, he had that. He said, if Jesus Christ be God and died for me, there's no sacrifice too great for me to make for him. Men and women tonight, listen, does riches really make a person happy? Does riches really bring a good family, true contentment? I want to tell you today, only Jesus Christ can bring true happiness and true peace and true joy. I've been with people, millionaires, multi-millionaires, down in the hospital and I've seen their money's no good to him. I was also reading this week about Steve Jobs, or Jobs, the founder of Apple. He died when he was 56 years of age. And when he died, he was reported to be worth 10.2 billion pounds. Imagine. 10.2 billion pounds. And do you know what he said as he was dying? Listen to this. My favorite things in life don't cost any money. It's really clear the most precious resource we all have is our time. How much time do we really give to the Lord's work? Or does he just get the leftovers of our week? And I speak to my own heart. How much time do I give him? Or am I in the comfort zone? God forbid that we would be in the comfort zone. Somebody said that the year of your birth and the year of your death and the line in between, that's your life. That's my life. And where does the time go, huh? Where does the time go? God's not really interested in the size of your house, the car that you drive or I drive, the number of holidays we go on, the money in our bank accounts. God wants you. God wants every part of me. And I remember an old preacher saying to me when I first became a Christian, when God sees the sacrifice, then he will send the fire. Not good. God can get the hold of a man or a woman or a young person who is yielded completely. That's the type of individual he's looking for and he can use. I want to be God's man. I trust in him. Do you want to be God's man? Do you want to be God's woman? Jesus said there was none greater than who? John the Baptist. Where would John the Baptist sit in our churches today? Huh? Lived in the wilderness. At locusts and wild honey. He wore camel skin clothing. He lived a humble life. Jesus said there was none greater than John the Baptist. And he was a man filled with the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb. Hmm. I like to stay around people regardless of their background who are filled with the Spirit of God. There are giants in my eyes. People that know the Lord. Not necessarily people with great money, great education, on and on and on, great houses. That doesn't appeal to me. People that know the Lord and know the fullness of the Spirit. Do you remember what the Lord said to the letter of saints? <coughs> Revelation 3, 17. Listen, this church thought they had everything. They were rich. They were increased with goods that needed nothing. But Jesus told them, listen, verse 17, Revelation 3, Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, but knowest not that you are rich, wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. What a verdict. And that church thought they had everything. The successful farmer. We can see this man today. Now here's the second point. I want to consider for a few minutes his sinful folly. Now, now, what was his sinful folly? Very simply, he thought that he had plenty of time. Look at verse 19. The rich man states, do you see it? And I will say to my soul, so there is much good laid up for many years. Take thy knees, eat, drink, and be merry. So friends, this rich farmer thought he was going to live for many years. He wanted to enjoy his sinful living. He wanted to take it easy. He wanted to have a, a great time. He believed 
the devil's lie. Is that you? You're going to get saved, but you keep putting it off, and you keep putting it off, and you keep putting it off. This is the devil's lie. He tells individuals that they have plenty of time. My father recently just retired from his work. He worked in the Belfast City Hospital for a number of years. And he was telling me about different men that never got to see the retirement. Different men that talked about their cruises and talked about traveling the world and talked about enjoying their pensions, coming up to retirement, but suddenly were not staying in the eternity. You know anybody like that? I'm sure many of you have worked with individuals over the years and they didn't get to see their retirement. They all thought that plenty of time. That's what my father was telling me. He says, I'm nice to be retired. He says, but I work with many boys in the hospital that didn't get to see him. Because now they're out in eternity. Many people think they're going to live forever. One old preacher said the road to hell is paved with good intentions. I believe there's people in hell today who were going to get saved one day, but they never did. Suddenly they were launched out into eternity. They lived as if God didn't exist. Maybe that's somebody in the tent today. Do you live as if God doesn't exist? The Bible says, the word lest he take me with a stroke. Not everybody gets to live a long life. You've heard that in the news recently. Young people launched out into eternity. I did a little Google search on people that died young. Listen to this. Elvis Presley died 42 years of age. Princess Diana died 36 years of age. Patsy Klein died 30 years of age. Bruce Lee died 32 years of age. Marilyn Monroe died 36 years of age. Martin Luther King died 39 years of age. Listen to some great Christian people that we all know. He didn't live a long life. Listen, Robert Murray McShane died 29 years of age. Jim Elliot died 28 years of age. William Wagenborn died 26 years of age. David Brainard died 29 years of age. Philip Bliss died 38 years of age. John Harper, there was a man that was a soul winner. There was a man that had a burden. He was on the Titanic the night it sank. Gave up his life jacket, went into the water, pointing souls to Christ. Man was a passion. What age was he? 40 years of age. Wow. And look at the impact that these individuals made. The Christian people that I mentioned there. Robert Murray McShane, 29 years of age. Not everybody gets to live to 70 or 80 or 90. But all oh, that our lives would make an impact to the kingdom of God. The Bible says, Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. And this man believed he had a soul, didn't he? That's a lot more than most today. The soul is the part of us that will live on forever. The Bible says it's either heaven or hell. Heaven or hell. You ever think about where you'll be a hundred years from now? Where you'll be a thousand years from now? The Bible says there's a step between life and death. As we close. The successful former <coughs> sinful father and finally his solemn future. Look at verse 20 as we finish. But God said unto him, Notice, thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? Friends, God calls this man a fool. Imagine God calling you a fool. Why? Because he had made no preparation for eternity. And the Bible has much to say about fools. We'll maybe preach on it someday. You get a little concordance and look at the many times the word fool or fools is mentioned. Let me give you a couple. Psalm 14, 1. The fool has said in his heart there's no God. 2 Samuel 3, 33. Died Abner as a fool died. Proverbs 12, 15. The way of a fool is right in his own eyes. But he that hearkeneth unto counsel is wise. That night, this man would be in eternity. I'm sure it was the talk of the countryside when everybody heard that he died. Can you see the neighbours talking? Did you hear who's died? That rich man up the road. 
he died. Suddenly. And I know in Belfast, where I live in the wee streets, if you hear somebody's died, the work gets round pretty quick. And I'm sure it's the same where, where you live. You went to the local shop, and then some, did you hear who died? You go to the chemist, <coughs> did you hear who died? Word travels quick. I'm sure everybody in the countryside was talking about this man. Now that he died. He never thought he was going to be next. Nobody does. None of us think we're going to be next. You could be next. Are you ready? I could be next. Thank God tonight I'm ready. I put my trust in Jesus Christ. I love him with all of my heart and I'm ready to go. Can you see this man in hell coming? I was thinking about him this afternoon. I wonder what he's thinking. He's been there now over 2,000 years. I wonder what he's thinking. I wonder what it was said was at his funeral. Can you see his funeral? Can you see the minister getting up in the coffin and the family and the flowers? I'm sure it's a great send-off. No doubt the minister said he was a great farmer. He was a great worker. He was a great family man. He was well-respected in the community. And so many clans, you've all been at funerals like that. He's probably even buried a Christian. But in God's eyes, he was a fire. He was a fire. And I'll tell you what he's thinking in hell tonight if only I'd have been saved. If only I'd have been ready. But friend, listen as a close, he missed them. Can I pray? Can I say tonight I'm praying with all of my heart that nobody here will miss it? And we're praying for you. There's tears on our prayer meetings over souls. We're praying for you that you'll not miss it. And that you'll not go to a lost eternity. Do you ever go to the cemeteries? Look at the headstones. Sometimes I would do that. You look at the headstones in the cemeteries and then usually in a lot of the graves there's a little verse, isn't there? A little Christian verse, the headstone. I'll tell you what verse you could put in this man's headstone. Jeremiah 8 and 20. The harvest is past. Summer has ended and we're not saved. And you see if he was here today? Can you see him here? And I brought him up for the closing hymn. What would he tell us to sing? He would say this all. And that's the thing. She would say, be in time. Be in time. When the voice of Jesus called you, he would say, be in time. He would say, I missed it. You're getting another opportunity. Maybe for someone it'll be their last. I don't know. But friend, take your opportunity today. Then sang about the cross. Can you see the Lord tonight on the cross just for you? How could you reject them again? Beaten, mocked, humiliated, marred more than any man. When I survey the wondrous cross, take a look at him today. Does it touch your heart? Does it ever bring a tear to your eye? That doesn't touch you. I don't know what will. I pray that you'll come to the Lord. And you leave this tent forgiven of your sins, forgiven of your past. And tonight, he will save you and he'll keep you. And you can join us in heaven. I trust we'll see you there. That you'll not end up in a lost eternity. This man died in his sins. I wonder what age he was. What do you think? Most think he was a young man. Because he thought he had plenty of time, many years. But he was taken suddenly. And it's amazing to think that your heart beats 100,000 times every day. And so does mine. You don't even think about it. It just feels like that. Doesn't it? And then just one day, it's And every one of those heartbeats is in the hand of God. And he can take it from us at any time. Just like this one. Trust. If tonight you were in eternity, you stood before the Lord, he would say, Well done, good and faithful servant. And he wouldn't say to anybody, Depart from me and never again. That's a word of prayer. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I'm going to give you an opportunity in the tent tonight to trust the Lord as your Savior. As you sit in your seat, pray simply from your heart, Lord, save my soul. 
forgive me of my sins and repent the name. Like if we're down on the cross for me, a guilty, hell deserving sinner, and from today I want to serve you for the rest of my life. I want to be in heaven. Help me to tell others I'm going to live for you and I'm going to serve you. Call upon his name today. And if you've drifted away, you're backslidden. Say, Lord, I'm coming home. Forgive me for the life I'm living. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Hold me with thy free spirit. From the naked, back to your first love. And even for us as Christians, those of us that are saved, let's pray that the Lord touches us afresh. And even when we begin this new week, we will get a passion for souls. Let's pray. thank you again for your presence your word reminds us to seek ye the Lord while he may be found call ye upon him while he is near Lord surely you're here today surely you're here and Lord we believe there's individuals here that need to get ready for eternity Lord I pray today they will come to the cross with their sin and shame and they will accept you as their own personal saviour Lord we've been reminded in our news over recent days and weeks of Individuals just launched out into eternity, so many different ages. Lord, help us to be ready. Help us, Lord, to be prepared to meet you. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you for listening so well. There's quarter past nine. I know many of you had a busy day. I really appreciate you coming and do your best to be with us throughout the rest of this forthcoming week in the will of the Lord. And as we say over these days, if myself or the pastor can help you, there's a caravan outside different individuals that come into the caravan to see us, to trust the Lord, and maybe that's you, maybe you would really love to be saved well, we're here to help you, or just maybe if you have trusted the Lord, come and tell us and let us know, confess with your mouth and uh, that will give you the real peace uh, in your heart, and with little booklets there too, with their telephone number in the back if you'd like one, take one at the door and give us a ring and we'll even, we'll even come to your home help you in any way. 312 then just to finish. <coughs> any Elvis Presley fans in here tonight? Well, do you know I was reading about Elvis Presley and seemingly his stepbrother was a, was a pastor. I didn't know that. Elvis Presley's stepbrother was a pastor. He was a man called, I've written it down, Rick Stanley. Rick Stanley. And after Rich Stanley got saved, he, he told Elvis Presley his testimony. And this is what Elvis Presley told him. It's time we all stopped fooling around and got ourselves right with God. That's what he said, Elvis Presley. I don't know where that man stood with the Lord. But after his, his stepbrother, Rich Stanley, got saved, he shared his testimony with Elvis Presley. That's what he said. Written it down. It's time we all stopped fooling around we got ourselves right with God. There's Elvis Presley had everything. What age was he when he died? Anybody know? I don't know. Maybe somebody knows. Was he in his 50s? Maybe 60s? I don't know. But a young man, really, had everything this world has to offer. He died young. Just shows you. None of us knows what's around the corner. But it's great many in the tent are saved. And you know it's well with your soul. <laughs> I trust you know it's well with yours. Thank you, Ross. 312. <laughs>
of Jesus calls them that they'll be in time. Lord, we have been involved in so many missions when people have been launched out into eternity, both during and after a mission. And God forbid that will be someone in the tent tonight. Lord, take us to our homes now in peace, sound, and safety, covering every car with a precious blood until we meet again. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for coming. Good night and safety.